copy that link. Do 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 do. Copy in the link. Boo, 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 boo. Copy in the link. If you want to copy a link, a great link to copy is our link tree in the bio of all of our social media. It has access to all of our socials and various platforms. That, what, what are you? What are you getting on? I'm trying to just post the link into our Discord so that people can come watch the live. But Discord's like, hey, look at all of our new features. I'm like, I don't care. I mean, if you got on Discord a little bit more, you wouldn't have to worry about that pop-up as much, because you would have dealt with it already. Discord has, what, daily updates of this? It feels like at this point. They always have that update button available to be hit. I don't know if they're doing any... I, I suspect they're not really doing anything particularly meaningful with those updates, but I'm also not a web developer. <laughs> so... If you want to join our Discord server, though, you can check us out, the Dungeon Bros Discord. Link in the link tree in the bio of all the various social media platforms. But this isn't a Discord podcast. This is a Dungeons & Dragons podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. But we are the Dungeon Bros. Indeed. I didn't do that at at the top of our thing, which is weird. Oh, well. We're getting too loose, fast and loose with this podcast. We... We are... I would describe ourselves as many things. Loose, definitely one of them. Fast... It, it, it depends on which one of us you're talking about. True. I can go. I can be quite speedy when it comes to running. Indeed. Indeed. I am not. <laughs> I am not. I can, now, can I hold my own when when my kids, my the kids that I coach when they're playing Ultimate Frisbee? Can I hold my own a little bit? Probably. I'd do better if it weren't muddy when we do it, but, you know, I can do fine. Mud is heavy. Yeah. Mud, mud is heavy, slippery, no no traction. It was a whole, it was a whole thing. That being said, uh, last last time on the podcast, about two weeks ago, uh, we we were like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to go see the D&D movie, and I can't wait to talk about it on the next podcast, do a full spoiler cast. Spoiler alert, uh, we haven't seen it. Nope. Uh, on the list, for the very near future, uh, it's reviewing quite well. Yeah, I know there was a lot of, there's been a lot of contention all the way up t- until the point of release where people are like, it's it's just going to be a bad movie. It's um, like... But yeah, well, you uh, we got the Rotten Tomatoes pool. Yeah, Rotten Tomatoes. It's a ninety percent on the tomato meter, ninety four percent in the audience score. Like people are loving this movie. It's doing very very well. It's one of the top movies of uh, its premiere weekend, and it, people are just and in a shot. In a, this this may be shocking to many people that do adaptations. For example, the the Super Mario Brothers movie also reviewing very very well yeah. right now. And it's almost like doing a faithful adaptation to a source material is all that you need to make a good adaptation. Like, put a little bit of care into it. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I mean, a lot of... I, I get the point Velma? Of like, well, there, there are certain <laughs> properties, that you can play around a little with. Like, video... Or, or not video games, but uh, comic books, where there's been a different million, a million different comic book runs. And there's been a million different movies featuring Superman. So sure, yeah. you can play around with the formula a little bit, but, you know, there's something to be said when, yeah, you, you have you take a very nostalgic and very loved piece of work and just then throw the wa- throw it at the wall. And, and mm. um, one, one thing I've been seeing from people online about Honor Among Thieves as well is that they, they were very restrained in the writing and weren't making, like, cracking jokes about critical hits or... Like I cast magic missile, or like anything, like or alluding to like a D twenty or a dot or any of that kind of shit. Like they just kept it in world, in mm-hmm. universe, and they just played it as straight. Now, do I wish that uh, a base level druid could wild shape like six times in a day, like apparently uh, the 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 druid tiefling does in the movie? Absolutely. Yeah, but it's a movie. It's a movie. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different forgotten realm. Yes. It's Chris Pine's Forgotten Realms. <laughs> I did see a, a, a note that, you know, he never casts a spell at the bar. Does never cast a spell mm-hmm. in the movie. And the the creator who was who was talking about this was like, it's fine by me. I enjoyed it. I need my dad. I need to have to explain this to my dad now because my dad loved Vox Machina. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Scanlan versus Chris Pine's bards are just drastically different. <laughs> And I need to explain why one gets a big purple hand and the other doesn't. It's... Think of the dads. Think of the dads. That is true. That is true. I do want to point out the the complete massive differences in The Legend of Vox Machina 
and the D&D movie and how they are both still good adaptations of D&D because they adapt different aspects of the game. Vox Machina is more is adapting a literal game that was played and makes allusions to the game system and makes jokes about D&D and the game like more of a meta thing in addition to being like a really well animated and well told story whereas the D&D movie is just in universe and we're going to be fun and it's going to be like just a lighthearted fun movie. You're going to get some references to what they're doing to make sense of it of yeah. being D&D but it's not necessarily you know oh why is this character not showing up because the player was late. Yeah. They didn't make exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, by the next episode, hopefully, we'll be doing a little bit of a spoiler cast, assuming that there isn't some major news. If there is some major news, we we might even just do like the spoiler cast as a bonus episode one maybe. day. Maybe maybe the day we see the movie that night, come back and just do a quick spoiler pack cast for like four or five minutes an hour. Maybe we'll see. Uh, one thing that we do know for sure: one week after the posting of this, we will be putting up a bonus episode of the podcast where we talk to our very good friend over at Found Familiar Dice. We talked about dice making. Yeah, it's a wonderful time. It's lovely. Go check them out. Found Familiar Dice on the TikToks and the Instagrams. As well as the dot coms. For as well as the dot coms. Ooh, the storefront. Yeah, he, he he did send us some dice a while ago. He he insists he insists that these were flawed castings of dice, and I think he's fucking unbelievably wrong. I cannot see any anything anything in those besides. We have actively actively looked for the problems in those dice, and we cannot find them. Uh, that being said, found familiar dice. Very well, very well made dice. They're expensive because they're good. Yes, they're very good. Love, love them. Love everything he's doing. You can check that out one week from the posting of this video, April nineteenth. Uh, before you know, well, well, in between, a little okay. bonus. Uh, Moving on, we got some D&D and MTG upcoming releases. We want to run through these, as always, just so you're aware of the products that are coming. We've got Big Boo Presents, Glory of the Giants, sometime this spring, apparently. We're in April. Still don't know the release date for that. Still don't know the release, the release date for that. Uh, the Keys of the Golden Vault has been out for a while. People like it. It's a little anthology thing. Got some heists. Love a good heist. Love the anthology books. Probably going to be the best one of the year. Uh, the Fandelver campaign setting is going to be this summer, 2023. Also this summer, The Book of Many Things, summer 2023. And then Planescape sometime in the fall of 2023. No specific release dates. Oddly vague. Oddly vague for how often they like to announce their release dates. Especially because they want to do one in the spring and they want to do two in the summer. So you would think beginning summer, end summer. So beginning summer would be like June. Yeah. Especially if they're going to, like, drop Glory of the Giants soon. Say, like, surprise, it's the end of April or beginning of May. And so, like, you need a little bit of time. So, like, probably mid to end of June. And then that would push the book of many things to late summer, like August, September, which then would push Planescape, like, to Christmas. Which, like, they, they are not hearing the community when we say, hey, you're putting, do, you're doing too much. I, Just give us quality instead of quantity. Especially right now when we're in a pre-1D&D universe where they're going to be releasing the next editions of the Player's Handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide in 2024. They need to, they need to pump the brakes a little bit. F- Fandelver campaign setting, totally fine. Uh, the Keys to the Golden Vault, totally fine. But like the Book of Many Things, Glory of Dragons, Planescape is probably a campaign setting of sorts. So like I get that too. Settings, fine. Rules augmentations to a game that you are already indicated you're going to in many ways sunset, probably not the best. Yeah. That's all for the upcoming D&D releases. We also have some Magic the Gathering releases. As of the posting of this, which will be April 12th, this coming weekend, we will get the pre-release for Magic the Gathering's next set, March of the Machines. Uh, We will be getting several pre-release kits to each for total that we will be opening live on stream next Monday, which is April the 17th. Uh, We keep one of the code cards within them because I play Magic Arenas. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other three will be given away to members of our Discord server. You can find the link in our link tree and all of our socials to do that. You can also join us live on Monday nights every night where we play Magic the Gathering. Six people have subscribed to us on TikTok. Yeah, it's insane. It's unnecessary. Beloved. We love our subscribers. Love our subs. But... Highly unnecessary. We do this for free. So, yeah. All the freeloaders need to pick it up. 
for free. Yeah. <laughs> free. Just pick up the free content that we're providing exactly. you and exactly. uh, you know, enjoy it. I don't and I don't I don't want I don't want me saying you're all freeloaders to come off as I don't like you. I love you. I love you freeloaders. I'm a freeloader. I love a freeloader. Mm-hmm. But call I call them like I see them. Now the people takes one to know one, you know. I know exactly. And now that and now that and now that people are paying us, which is ludicrous, Ooh. Luda. Uh, I feel the need to call them out as as what they are, which is freeloaders. I love a freeloader. Continue to freeload, please. As you continue to freeload, we'll continue to announce <laughs> the upcoming uh, Magic Gathering sets, which includes Lord of the Rings: The Universes Beyond. I'm going to lose so much of my money. June, the release for that would be June 23rd, and then they would be doing a secondary holiday release on November 3rd. They didn't, they didn't think my spring-summer money was good enough for them, so they want my holiday money as oh. well now. See, I think this is one of the few times that things that Wizards of the Coast do does make sense, is do two releases of possibly one of the biggest sets Oh yeah. Ever. Oh yeah. Um, people, are going, people are going rampant for this Lord of the Rings set. I myself included. Yeah, the, it's it's going to be the big release of the year, I think. Well, well that and Commander Masters. Yes, and all. Commander Masters is going to come out <laughs> August fourth. Though that's going to be probably the most expensive set. Yeah, I mean pre-release prices are already preposterous, unnecessarily high. I would. I would pre-order argue. things, guys. Just wait, wait till it comes out. Yeah, and buy it. I, I totally agree, especially especially in. In gaming, tabletop video gaming, all that kind of stuff, don't pre-order. The only time, the only time I would pre-order a video game is two specific, three specific instances. A Kingdom Hearts game is coming out because I'm going to play them all. I, I'm, I'm hooked on that series. It's happening. Same for Persona. That's the second one. I'm gonna buy that game. I'm gonna buy Persona Six Sight Unseen. And if you like a game and it's coming out, and if you pre-order it by the digital storefront of your console and they give you the ability to pre-download it so that you can pre-download and pre-install it mm-hmm. and then it unlocks at the release time so you don't have to download it and then wait for it to download and install before playing the game. I'm okay with that. Like, a couple days before, you're like, I'm going to get this game on its release date. That's I'll, fine. I'll do the pre-order so I can pre-download it. That's totally fine. Don't be, don't be like, oh shit, they announced fucking the next Elder Scrolls game and people have pre-ordered the next Elder Scrolls game, even though you know nothing about it, and they announced it, like, four years ago. Yeah. <laughs> See, I, I used to understand pre-ordering more when, like, oh, you pre-order through GameStop, GameStop, and then you all got a metal case, and you got yeah. a six-foot statue of the main character, and a tomahawk. Yeah. That's Assassin's Creed 3, specifically. Yeah. Uh, but I love nowadays, it. nowadays you get, okay, maybe it's some digital skin and a couple of free levels. Yeah. Digital, pre-ordering is out the window, if you ask me. It's, it's largely, especially when a lot of, like, the digital assets, if it's a popular game, they'll eventually just let you download for free or for, like, a buck yeah. later on. Um, and then I can, I can understand the, the, you know, once we get into tabletop pre-release stuff or, like, pre-order stuff, sure. The that pre- seems a little more reasonable when you get down to it. Again. You don't need to. Especially with cards, since all of these booster packs are random. Yes. You're, we're not going to know what the realistic value of these cards are until people start opening them. And there is a supply. This is all based on theoretical supply. Wait for real supply. See where the prices actually end up. Are you going to get burned on some individual cards? Yes, but you're probably going to be able to get the sealed product for cheaper. Mm-hmm. Unless, you know, you're the Edgar Markov commander deck. <laughs> there are exceptions to the rule. Sure. As always. Um, so are we done with our diatribes? I, we, we've gotten off track already twice <laughs> in this. Uh, in it, this does not, just, it does not take much. In, in this uh, upcoming releases announcement. We're 15 minutes in. All right, let's get into the news. We got the, as some of you might remember, Wizards of the Coast announced they were going to have the D&D Creator Summit, which has already happened. We were not invited because we're not very big. But to be fair. I saw creators who are only slightly bigger than us getting invited, so maybe absolutely, you know, you know. if you like us, you know, like, subscribe, help us. I, I think that we'll get big enough to be invited next time and let you know firsthand. I don't think TikTok creators were really there because I don't think they they were doing TikTok creators all that much. It was mostly YouTubers and streamers and so that kind of stuff. YouTube and like, yeah, subscribe. Yeah, subscribe to us there. We have over seven hundred subscribers already, even though we only put up the podcast as a and some uh, shorts. That being said. 
Uh, this is just a collection of tweets from people that were at the event, and we've learned a lot more about 1D&D and what they want to go with, as well as had some uh, screenshots from some upcoming, uh, from some upcoming uh, playtest material, which will be very exciting to see. Uh, Nerd Immersion, one of the YouTubers that was there, gave us several bits of information detailing some things about the 2024 Player's Handbook. It's going to be longer than the 2014 Player's Handbook by about 32 to 64 pages. It includes 12 total classes, 48 subclasses. All the subclasses will have art associated with them. Nine species, including the Goliath as one of the species, and they have removed the half-elf and the half-orc, mm. saying that if you want to be a half-species, just be a half-species and pick one of the racial stats to use for your statistics. Uh, it also includes new backgrounds, feats, spells, equipment, and weapons with background art in all locations. Fascinating. Um, they, they, announced, they specified that the updated version of the player's handbook is going to be uh, backwards compatible with the 2014 uh, version of the Player's Handbook aware uh, as well. We've been aware of that for a while. Um, a couple other random things. Uh, the Monk's Key Points are being renamed to Spirit Points. Mm -hmm. uh, their specific reasoning for that, uh, they didn't want the Monk to quote-unquote feel Asian. I think it's a little bit unnecessary. I, I personally think it's a bit unnecessary because I don't really read Monks as particularly Asian. Anyway, I mean, if you, if you look at like the uh, the you know, historical medieval Europe monk versus the historical Asian style monk, mm -hmm. a lot more martial arts on the uh, Asians on that side of the world as opposed to you know the friars in uh, yeah in in Europe. I just feel like they, they could here, though. I feel like they could just um, then they in a whole point of like what's renaming the monk entirely True. just um but even with the rise of like the ufc and martial arts being worldwide and global and when i think of martial arts i don't think of karate i don't think of bruce lee i mean i think of bruce lee a little bit but i i my brain immediately goes I always think of bruce lee. i love bruce lee i my brain immediately goes to the ufc hmm. which is anyone true so that's just me it's just a change it doesn't really affect anything uh, that is also going to be subject to feedback and play testing the big the big thing that we've gotten uh is a creator what's his name in Indest indestructible boy we were yeah, indestructible boy leaked uh was the first one to leak something about the uh, ogl not being updated yes way back last year at the end of last year yeah he was he was on the forefront of the ogl nonsense um but he showed us weapon tables from the player's ham or from a playtest material that they're going to release. Uh, and it's got a lot of really interesting things. Most of the weapons are fairly unchanged in the damage and properties department with some with some tweaks. Um, a lot a lot of them have been bumped up in damage from like a D6 to a D8 from dealing one damage to one D4 damage, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Uh, there's only one weapon now that only deals a single point of damage, uh, and that is the blowgun. Uh, that is just because they want they want the blowgun to be like adding poisons and stuff to it, so that you're doing it's just an apparatus to deal damage with other things. But the main the main thing is all of these weapons are going to have another column for quote unquote mastery. Yes. Uh, the mastery mechanic is going to include features that can be unlocked by picking specific character paths, whatever the fuck that means. Leveling up, training, spending downtime, I have no idea. Uh, but they add properties such as nick, slow, push, puncture, flex, topple, graze, cleave, and sap. And it seems like they're almost like uh, conditions or other various spell effects uh one last big note here they also include the musket and the pistol in the player's handbook as opposed to just optional things in the dungeon master's guide so firearms are php legal now yeah this looks like it's a push at actually making martial characters more powerful because mm -hmm. that's always been an issue where you have the linear fighter versus the exponential wizard yeah um i don't know if this is going to you know maybe be a perfect solve because eventually these just start coming down to all right are you a spellcaster or are you a uh, condition-inflicting martial 
yeah. character. Uh, I mean, again, still more fun, more things, more mechanics to use, but... It also depends on what these conditions are going to be, That's which true. we don't really know yet. If Yeah, if it takes me uh, eight levels to get into, you know, just to get one of these buffs, like, is it really worth it? Yeah. If they hand me one at, like... Maybe if we, well, the warrior class is hypothetically going to come out, or the warrior subgroup is going to come out mm-hmm. soon, and so we might be able to see. Oh, okay. When I take when I you know every four every four levels or every three levels, you know something like that, we'll have to see when the one D and D play test for the warrior subgroup comes out. Yeah, uh, I think as long as these aren't mechanically intensive features and conditions something that's like simple uh easily referenceable Mm -hmm. uh within the player's handbook or maybe uh, maybe whenever they i assume they're going to redesign the the character sheet as well yeah yeah. since they're adding a lot of new things yeah and changing some stuff uh so hopefully there's a spot with the martial weapons and features where you can put that information uh we we talked at length in previous one D and D playtest materials about our love of the slowed condition. Yes, the slowed condition. Uh, which they if if the weapon masteries that inflict that have slow attached to them, they include things like uh, it looks like the club, the light crossbow, and the sling. Uh, so I doubt they would be inflicting the slowed condition itself. Or um, perhaps removing speed from an uh from the person who takes damage from it yes such as like oh you hit him in the you hit him in the kneecap you kneecapped him yeah kneecapped him uh some things that just seem like a bit still too similar there are a couple of weapons namely uh battle axe and longsword both do 1d8 slashing damage versatile for 1d10 they are both flex mastery uh, the longsword costs five gold more and weighs one pound less. That is the only difference between them, mechanically speaking, hmm. which is a little bit strange to me. Um, we also got things like the pike as a uh, melee weapon as well. That's going to be a 1d10 piercing, heavy, reaching two-handed weapon with push, whatever that ends up meaning. Uh, but most of these weapons are largely unchanged, just adding a new mechanic on top of them. I don't, so I'm not sure. I, I've long raged against the specific feat of uh, weapon expert, where mm-hmm. you, get four addition, you get four additional weapon proficiencies. Um, completely useless feat in 5e. I don't know if adding a single, uh, op, a single hypothetically optional route specific mechanic to these weapons will actually improve that. Now, that that is true. I think these should be just intrinsic abilities to the weapon that if you have proficiency in the weapon, you can just do. Um, does that make level one a little bit more powerful than might be balanced? Uh, you can have that argument. Um, maybe because my brain immediately goes to how. Um, the vestiges of divergence in in critical role are with like dormant dormant awakened exalted like mm-hmm. leveling a weapon i love that mechanic but for a basic weapon having some sort of sub leveling within your the abilities of a single basic weapon i feel like it's going to be way too complex that's so, fair yeah so i don't know how they plan on doing that maybe it's like at level 5 Pretty much every warrior class gets an extra attack. So maybe at level three, you get access to your weapon masteries for weapons that you're proficient with, or level seven, or whatever. If they wait till level seven, I think that's a mistake. I agree. Uh, I would want. I think they should do that early. Pick it up with a subclass. Um, I, I suspect there's going to be subclasses that grant weapons additional mastery features, which I think is a cool design mechanic they can build around. Same with feats. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe. Well, we all, we've also kind of already seen that they're still do, going the route of like martial weapon proficiency and simple weapon proficiency as opposed yeah. to specific weapons. Um, so that would like limit classes to certain weapons. And that's an unnecessary limitation. And then it gets there's a whole snowball of effects here that we're not really going to know until we get the Warriors uh, playtest. Yep, so we will... When, once the Warriors playtest comes out, you will uh, hear it from us, mm-hmm. and we'll talk about it. Uh, 
one thing that Indestructible also tweeted that doesn't really have any details associated with it is uh, apparently magic items will get more clear pricing structures and improvement on their pricing structures. So magic items will get cheaper, or probably consumables are going to get cheaper and more reasonable pricing for specific magic items, which cool, we'll have to wait and see. Um, major changes to the PHB and DMG in uh, making it more inclusive and beginner friendly, as well as better for reference books. Mm. Um, the new player's handbook and Dungeon Master's Guide are going to have sections devoted to session zero, as well as safety tools for groups. Uh, the They will also include uh, glossaries uh, in the books, uh, the PHB is going to have a rules glossary and the DMG is going to have a lore glossary, making it easier to look stuff up, uh, get definitions of things. Instead of having to flip through the entire book, you can just go to the glossary section, alphabetically organized. Much improvement, just making them better as reference books. Yeah, I think that's a current problem that I still find when I introduce new players is the, you know, the question, do I have to read this entire thing? I'm no. The PHB, for those of you on the audio-only uh, version of this podcast. Um but to be able to just have a section that says, okay, just read, if you're interested, you can just read these five pages. Yeah. And that'll give you everything that, you know, that'll get you on started and then we'll meet up and we'll go through everything else you need to know. Yeah. Uh, I love, I love, I, w- I was surprised that the PHB didn't already have like a proper rules glossary. It has an index and it has mm-hmm. a table of contents, but having a proper rules glossary, I think is going to be a very, very useful tool just for playing the game i think it also helps that in in d and one dmd they are actually giving a lot more things names because obviously there's the conditions appendix Mm -hmm. in in the 2014 version but now they're adding a lot more named things a lot more keywords in which i think is good just to be able to say this you see this word this means this thing yes it, that, so you're, it out every time. you're not going to have to search throughout the book, find the section that that is listed in, and that now it's all just alphabetical order, this chunk of the book. That's probably going to be a bulk of the extra page count that you're getting mm-hmm. out of the player's handbook is going to be that rules glossary, which is just top tier. Very well done. Uh, one quick thing about the monster manual. They're going to be including... Uh, CR 10 and above monsters and they're going to make them hit a lot harder so your harder your higher CR monsters are going to be more readily available in base Dungeons and Dragons as well as uh, being a lot scarier yeah that's what? definitely a problem is because uh, you look and you're like wow this is okay this is a pretty high CR and then you go and actually play it and it's like and they got thwomped they got thwomped I didn't they don't really have any cool effects or features they just have sometimes higher armor class yeah we were I mean we've the lich has been talked at nauseum uh, for how fairly easy it is to deal with mm-hmm. just a base lich at, at, at its CR listing especially uh, other creatures like the vampire fairly underpowered uh, beholder is still a good threat just because it can do a lot of unique stuff but uh, getting some of these higher CR monsters, the buffs they need to handle themselves more on in a one-on party situation, mm-hmm. I think is going to be a lot better. Uh, some virtual tabletop things are going to be the last bits we talk about. Uh, the VTT is using Unreal Engine because they wanted to ensure uh, portability and compatibility between PCs, gaming consoles, and mobile devices. Uh, and they also confirmed that the VTT is going to be a standalone desktop app and will not be available in the web browser. Mm-hmm. So we've talked at nauseum, like, are they going to include it in game consoles? This is one step closer to getting the VR headset support <laughs> <laughs> that, that we think is just a no brainer for a product like this. Um, I mean, it makes total sense. Sure. Building it in Unreal Engine, especially. We, we talked about this last episode where uh, after, right after the D&D uh, Direct, and they did a, a long piece on the VTT. So this does answer a few more questions about that. Again, the VTT, while cool, I don't know if they're really hitting the corner of the market they necessarily need to be with it at yeah. this time. Yeah. Um, we'll have, we really just have to see once it comes out. Yeah. Uh, there is a ton of other random little bits and doodads that were announced at the Creator Summit. Uh, those were just the ones that we were able to very easily find on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
I'm, any of the creators that actually went to it, I assume, are going to be having videos. I know Bob the World Builder went. He hasn't made a video about it yet. Um, Nerd Immersion. Cast Party. Got yeah. Invites. Uh, check, out, check out all your favorite uh, D&D creators. Uh, they, I'm sure they will eventually have breakdowns of what they talked about at the Creator Summit, uh, which is very, very exciting. Uh, moving away from D&D for a moment, Paizo uh, announced uh, the, the preliminary release of... Their open RPG creative license, a.k.a. known as the Orc license. Uh, they developed this in response to the OGL controversy, and it's got a couple of key differences. It is largely the same as the open gaming license as it is now, after all of the kerfuffle, uh, providing a lot of similar protections, but with some notable differences. The D&D OGL is now in uh, Creative Commons, meaning it can't be taken out of Creative Commons and people can do whatever they want with it. The Orc license is a specific license that is not in Creative Commons. They debated putting it in Creative Commons because there are two main types of Creative Commons licenses. The first one allowing uh, downstream creators requiring them, sorry, to make the content that they derive from that from that Creative Commons material to also be Creative Commons. And then the other one would prevent downstream uh, licensors from using content made by any other downstream licensor. So you could only license the actual original licensed works. And they wanted a bit of a hybrid between the two. So instead, they're going to be registering it with the Library of Congress in the United States. Uh, That way it is not controlled by any specific organization in an attempt to prevent any similar situation to what recently happened with the OGL earlier this year. Uh, You can check out the entirety of their draft of the ORC license on... uh, uh, Paizo, if you go to their Twitter account, it's one of the top tweets. It's the most recent one. Uh, it's a four-page license. It largely offers a lot of similar protections to what people wanted from the OGL. So if you want to check that out, you absolutely can. The Orc license, of course, is going to be adopted by, I'm sure, many, 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 many third-party creators going forward, especially after all the OGL nonsense. Mm-hmm. And I do like that just right up front, they're doing what uh, Wizards of the Coast kind of feigned that they were doing, which is Paizo has put this out and right on the copy, it says, this is, this is a, a, a draft. Mm-hmm. Please provide feedback. Yes. It, it, it's a watermark on the yes. PDF itself. Um, and there's, there was so much contention with the OGL and uh, this is not the only uh, uh, third. This is not the only other um, creation that we've seen coming out of this that we'll talk about today. But it is probably the biggest and most direct answer to mm-hmm. that to Wizards of the Coast's big mistake. Yeah, I do want. I I don't know the answer to this, and I, I don't know if anybody has looked into it. If those are the two main types of Creative Commons licenses that they were trying to avoid with the Orc one, so they could get a bit of a hybrid approach. Mm-hmm. Which version of the Creative Commons license is the current, the upcoming current OGL using? That's a good question. I I, I would imagine from their perspective, it would have to be the one where you can't like um, derivative work or licensed works not being automatically Creative Commons available would be my guess. Yeah. Unless they were still trying to do like a backhanded, like, like stick it to the man, <laughs> like, oh yeah, you want to use anything from our Creative Commons license? Your shit's Creative Commons too. Get fucked, you know. I don't know. That's something to look into. Either way, if you include a, a lot of people that are creating stuff for um, with the open with the proper Creative Commons license for the OGL. I assume are going to make their own stuff Creative Commons as well, just by default, Probably. regardless of which I mean, version. Most most third party creators, especially the ones that get big, mm-hmm. you know, are the ones that were affected by this. And we can't imagine. It'd be hard to imagine that they go that they're that they go to Wizards and say you can't do this to us, and then just turn around and do the same thing and do the opposite to their consti- constituents, to their patrons, their patrons, their <laughs> constituents, <laughs> our duly elected representatives of the D and D third party <laughs> community. <laughs> Yes, so check out the Orc license if you are a creator of a third-party tabletop product. Check it out. Especially if it's not D&D related. So, 
go do that. Uh, lastly, for the main items, uh, we've got full set release for Magic the Gathering's March of the Machines, the newest Magic the Gathering set pre-releasing this weekend, mm-hmm. as we talked about at the top of the show. Uh, we're going to just go over some of the new cards, some of the mechanics, and uh, some more of the weird doodads. Yeah, doodads <laughs> is a good... That, <laughs> some <laughs> ran, some more of the random shit. Uh, the booster packs. Oh my gosh, hold on, let me look this up. Ah, oh, man, this is going to be a pain in the ass to edit. I might just leave this all in, uh, just to spite you guys. But, uh, March of the Machines, we know some of the set mechanics, as well as the booster packs. They are including a couple of different unique slots in the booster packs now, uh, mainly to accommodate the, uh, the, oh, what's the terminology they use for it? The, the dual, the dual legendary creature cards. They're not double faced, but they have two legendary creatures that they kind of smashed together in some regards, uh, combining their abilities. And I believe every single one of those boosters are going to include, uh, one of those cards. Uh, they also have a slot for where you can possibly hit previously released cards as well. Uh, for example, oh, what are they? Oh my gosh, this is a terribly laid out article. I'm sorry. <laughs> the Multiverse Legends, that's what they're calling it, where you can get reprints of some of the great legendary creatures from other Magic the Gathering sets, including Elish Norn Grand Cenobite, Emery Lurker of the Lock, Niv Mizzet Reborn, Shieldred the Whispered one, Whispering One, because we need more of that, <laughs> and, and Skythrix the Blight Dragon. They are going to include new art for those creatures. They're not guaranteed in every pack, but there is a slot that they can appear in. Uh, the double the double legend commander cards are probably the most exciting part of this set right now. They really are. They offer... Most legendary cards offer usually just one pretty simple mechanic. It's very interesting to see all of these new, you know, new legends that come together to fight the Phyrexians how each of their abilities they've taken and kind of fused into one. Um, I've uh, watched some of the breakdowns, different ones of, uh, you know, different deck possible deck builds for some of these new uh, dual, these new friendly uh, legends, and you can get real weird weird builds going. Okay, so I found it. Uh, The set booster contents. You get one art card. Art card is the foil... Art cards, also, they have foil stamped versions that are in 10% of packs. Everyone knows the art cards. They're very uh, worthless. You get one rare or mythic rare. You get one multiverse legend. So you are guaranteed a multiverse legend is going to be uncommon, rare, or mythic. You get one traditional foil that is going to be common, uncommon, rare, or mythic. You get two wild card slots that can be any card that is common, uncommon, rare, or mythic. You get one double-faced battle that is a guaranteed uncommon battle. A battle is a new card type. Uh, we You get one slot for a double-faced common or uncommon that could be a battle. It could be one of the, any of the other double-faced commons or uncommons. There's a lot that have transform properties of creatures becoming Phyrexian, mm-hmm. uh, which is cool. Two slots for uncommons, two slots for commons, one basic land or dual land. Uh, traditional foils are going to be in 20% of the packs. Full art basic lands are in 36% of the packs. And then one token slash add card, helper card, or card from the list will be included in each set booster. Uh, draft boosters, somewhat similar. One multiverse legend at uncommon, rare, or mythic. One double-faced battle at uncommon, rare, or mythic. One single-faced, unrare, uncommon, <laughs> rare, un- unrare, uncommon, rare, or mythic. One double-faced, common, uncommon, rare, or mythic. Two uncommons eight commons, one basic land or dual land, and then one token add card. That means in draft boosters, there are four, there, there are packs out there where you can get four mythic rares in yeah. one single draft pack, which is unreasonable. Uh, the collector... Especially if you're trying to draft. Oh, yeah. If you're trying to draft. The, you're like, great, can't. Won't probably cast that. Won't probably cast that. Won't probably cast... Uh, okay, there we go. Yeah. Uh, the collector boosters, you get one foil serialized or non-serialized multiverse legend at rare or mythic rare. One traditional foil alt border rare or mythic or a double rainbow foil serialized praetor at mythic. 
There's serialized cards again. That, that's a, the collector that's boosters are ridiculous. Become the uh, the new norm is to put out uh, serialized cards with uh, with more sets. It seems. Yeah, they they first did that with the warm coil engine in the recent Brothers War, and now it's seemingly now, all the time. Now, Praetors, we know there's going to be serialized cards in Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Uh, One ring. Also in the collector booster, one slot for special foil serialized or non-serialized multiverse legend at uncommon, one non-foil extended art rare mythic showcase rare mythic or borderless mythic, one non-foil extended art commander rare mythic or jumpstart rare, one traditional foil rare mythic, one traditional foil multiverse uncommon, two traditional foil uncommons, five traditional foil commons, one traditional foil full art basic land, and one traditional foil double-sided token. (sighs) So there's the breakdowns of that. Um, there's going to be draft. There's going to be set. There's going to be collector. There's going to be jumpstart. Probably don't get the jumpstart packs. Yeah, probably not get the jumpstart don't, packs. Don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. Um, okay, where's, okay, another spreadsheet. The fact that they have to do a spreadsheet so that you know what y- you can get in all of them is ridiculous. Uh, the only type of foil that you will find in draft boosters are traditional foils. The only... The only foils you will find in set boosters are traditional and foil etched foils. Collector boosters will have all of the types, traditional foil, foil etched cards, halo foiled cards, and double rainbow foil serialized cards. Uh, Draft boosters, you can get multiverse legend cards, at least one in every pack, and then a 33% chance of uh, getting a full art basic land. Set boosters, it's one in 36% chance of getting a full art basic land, and you have at least one multiverse legend in every pack. Collector boosters, you get a guaranteed full art basic land. You get three multiverse legend cards in every pack. You get one to three extended art cards in every collector booster pack, and uh, less than 1% of collector boosters will have a serialized card. I want to touch on foils real quick. Uh, in the past... In the last I love set. touching foils. Foils are great. Um, <laughs> in the last set, in Martin, uh, uh, all of we won, we actually saw the new foil printers uh, seem to be doing better. Less pringling overall, in, in, from what I could tell. Pringle, pringling is, is the act of your card curling to look like a Pringle. Mm-hmm. Does not taste like pingle, Pringle, trust us. Um, even if you fry them. Even if you fry them. <laughs> but they had all these different, you know, they have the halo foil, the double rainbow foil. Maybe it's just my ineptitude to look clearly at what I'm at my cards, or maybe it's just the fact that they I can never tell the difference. They all look the fucking same. On Pokemon cards, oh, I can tell the very different. They have Pokemon is probably like the premier when it comes to foiling. The printing is actually really, really nice. Printing's really good. The different types of foil are drastically different. Mm-hmm. Um and Magic has done the drastically different foil. Like, the oil slick foils were awesome. The step and complete from All Will Be One, getting the Phyrexian symbol in the foils, that shit's cool. All the other foils are just kind of the same. Maybe maybe we're just inept. We but might be inept. Maybe we're not connoisseurs. Maybe not. But I, I agree. The foil, the foil situation in the printing needs to be more standardized. I know they're... I know they're releasing a lot of sets and printing a lot of cards. Maybe they should slow down so they could ensure the quality of them. Isn't that a, isn't that a novel idea? Uh, there's three set mechanics that are going to be uh, new with March of the Machines. The first one we've alluded to before, it's the battle card. It's the most significant change. You get one guaranteed in pretty much every pack that you're going to be opening. Which these are interesting. You choose an op- when you play it. You choose an opponent to defend it. And they can defend it like they would a planeswalker with their own life total. Mm-hmm. And once you, or I suppose you're, I guess anyone anyone could target does it. Enough damage to it to remove all of the damage counters from it. You flip it over onto your uh, on, and you have now mm-hmm. a permanent. Uh, thankfully, the battles they also give you an effect when you cast them and choose a person to defend it. So you get an effect on casting, and then they will flip to their backside, which is usually the part that you really want out of the battles. Mm-hmm. And then you get that on your side as a permanent. Uh, that is the biggest one. It's going to really shake up how magic is played, especially in uh, standard. Uh, and more in like current draft environments for this are going to be very different because of this new mechanic. Uh, it, d- it is defense counters as well, so they can be proliferated. They can get you can get all the interactions that you normally could with any other kind of counter. 
They can be pinged by damage. They can be attacked. Yes, yes. Uh, just like a planeswalker. Uh, just like a planeswalker. The, one of the other two mechanics is the backup mechanic. When you have a creature that has, for example, backup one, when you cast that creature, you can designate one plus one plus one counter to be assigned to either it or another creature you control. If it is another creature you control, you also get the... Uh, effect of whatever is beneath the card. For example, Archpriest of Shadows card says backup one, which means only one plus one plus one counter can be assigned. If another creature that isn't Archpriest of the Shadows receives the counter, that creature also gains death touch and whenever this card, whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player or battle, return target creature card from the graveyard to the battlefield. So you can, for one turn, for one turn. until the end of turn. turn. Granting temporary keywords and temporary ability copying to theoretically non-summoning sickness creatures that you already have is very powerful. This is a I love this mechanic. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, this is super cool. It, it and you know just instead of having to choose what creatures you want because you need specifically these keywords, being able to all right, I've got a I've got something re- set up and ready to go. I'm going to lay down this thing that I don't know if they're, you know, obviously some of these backup cards are probably going to be a little more expensive, you know, mana expen- mana intensive, there we go, mana intensive, but to be able to grant a creature that couldn't otherwise get maybe death touch, or yeah. I couldn't otherwise get something, this ability, it's pretty pr- powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the last set mechanic is the incubate feature it is incubate followed by a number the number representing not the number of tokens that you create with this ability but the number of plus one plus one counters you put upon a single token so for example incubate two would create an incubate token with two plus one plus one counters on it an incubate token has the ability of pay two mana of any color and you transform it when you flip it and it's transformed it is a zero zero uh phyrexian card uh, so its power and toughness would be equal to the number of plus one plus one counters on it. In the case of Incubate 2, that would make it a 2-2. Two, two. Um, for example, Glissa, Herald of Predation, has the ability Incubate 2 twice, which will create two tokens, each with two plus one plus one counters on them, which you can then pay two mana to flip one of them and two mana to flip the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, another example they have is Brimaz, Blight of Areskos, has Incubate X, where X is that spell's mana value uh, whenever you cast a Phyrexian creature or an artifact creature spell. So when you cast one of those, you get to incubate and equal to the mana value, you can put that many plus one plus one counters on it. Uh, incubate on a lot of these cards is also uh, an enter the battlefield effect. Mm-hmm. So blink spells are going to be very, very powerful, giving you a lot of those tokens, especially ones that have like incubate three, four, or five, where you can make really big creatures. And we're seeing a lot, this is kind of uh, going to be a key trait of the Phyrexian, or, uh, the Phyrexian tribal, mm-hmm. the tribal decks. Um, we're seeing a lot, especially with the Praetors, uh, the Praetor cards that are coming in this set, a lot of this Phyrexian tribal style uh, mechanics now that we see for, you know, a lot of soldiers, merfolk, wizards throughout the others, but now it's, there's a Phyrexian tribal. I think that's awesome. Phyrexians needed a proper tribe mechanic, I, I think. Uh, we also know what the March of the Machine commanders are going to be. Uh, the aforementioned Brimaz, Blight of Areskos, as well as Gimbal, Gremlin Prodigy, Kasal, the Broken Halo, Sadar Jabari of Zalfir, and Bright Palm, Soul, Awakener are going to be the commander decks. Five five commander decks. Five commander decks. It's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. Uh, we also mentioned the uh, the reprints that we're getting for March of the Machines that are going to have different uh, art, multiverse legends, Elish, Elish Norn, Grand Cenobite, etc. We, were in, we mentioned those earlier. Those are the main differences. Uh, Samuel, you also have a list of a bunch of the cards that we're really into correct or did you just pull up scryfall i was just pulling up scryfall to look at things no i did want to mention one more thing uh it is mentioned in this article but is not highlighted very well it is that each of the commander decks will come with plane chase cards oh that is right which plane chase is a mechanic that basically uh every i believe every turn players roll dice and then sometimes you planes walk to a new plane when you do that you get a new effect on the battlefield kind of an over a global enchantment if you will um, plane chasing commander, I think, is a great place for those cards. Mm-hmm. 
And so, uh, yeah, they've, they're bringing, I believe, five new plane chase cards per of, uh, per deck of uh, pre-con deck. Mm-hmm. So that'll be very interesting, and I'm actually kind of excited. I want to play some plane chase now. I've never, oh, I've never yeah. played plane chase before, but that seems pretty cool. Now we now we will go over uh, some of our top cards, some of the cards we're interested in for the March of the Machines. Uh, a ton of those little dual command. They're, some people call them partner commanders. They are not partner commanders because they don't have the partner mechanic yes. as- associated with them, but double, like two character commanders. Yes. Um, the article that we had pulled up highlighted Borborygmos and Fibblethip. <laughs> hey, two Cyclops creatures. They got two eyes now, which yep. is great. These cards are going to be very powerful, and they're going to have multiple abilities attached to all of them, making them really, really good commanders for the oh, most yeah. part. Um, one of my favorites that I'm looking forward to is Slimefoot and Squee mm-hmm. uh, from Dominaria. This um, allows, When it enters the battlefield, you create a Sapperling token, and then uh, when it's in the graveyard, you can... Pay its mana cost, I believe, plus a sapperling token to pull it and one other card out of mm-hmm. the graveyard onto the battlefield. That's pretty cool. I've I've already built a deck around it. I'm just waiting <laughs> for that commander. Uh currently my favorite of the two character commanders is Galta and Maverin. Oh yeah. Uh it is a three green green white white, so a seven mana, twelve twelve with trample. It is a dinosaur vampire. It is Maverin Fane riding Galta. Uh, whenever you attack, you get to choose one. You can cre- create. You basically are creating a number of one-one vampires with lifelink, or one big green dinosaur, <laughs> where uh, X is the greatest power among uh, attacking creatures. And then in the case of the one-one vampires, X is the number of other attacking creatures. So a commander that you can do both. You can dynamically do go big or go wide yes. in your attacking strategy and then a seven mana 12 12 with trample in selesnia colors is just real <laughs> nice if you will there's also a lot of other cool ones uh Kroxa and kunaros i think is going to be a cool co- uh, combination um gosh well oh ooh. The Omnath Locus of All. This isn't a, a combo, but they finally gave a oh, five-color yeah. Omnath, and it's Phyrexian. A lot of these completed Phyrexian, the legends that have been completed, mm-hmm. Omnath is one, uh, uh, Coma is one. Coma. Heliod. Heliod. Well, Heliod's got to transform. Yeah, a lot. They, they completed a lot of their the main colors of gods in the in the Theros block. Which breaks my heart. I love Theros. So there's going to be a lot of story implications that come from this. And as we visit, you know, new uh, different planes going forward, that's probably what it's going to be focused a lot on. Like, you know, uh, for example, on Dominaria, the Kenrith Royal, uh, the Royal lineage is dead. The the King and Queen are dead on, uh, that's been already a card announced for, uh, March of the Machines Aftermath. We know the Therosian mm. God... The Therosian God The card. Therosian God cards! Uh, the five monocolor <laughs> com- uh, gods have been completed, and now yeah. we might ha- they, they might have to get new gods. That's... Um, that makes me sad. I love Theros. <laughs> they fucking massacred Theros. Uh, before we move on to other card types, I do just also want to shout out uh, Yargle and Multani. Oh, yeah. A, three, a three-colorless black, black, green... 18-6 vanilla creature. Vanilla, <laughs> vanilla creature. legendary frog spirit elemental. <laughs> Fling that at someone's face. Now, Let's give that you make a back <laughs> You know what? Make that make a backup deck, a backup th- you know with all the backup cards. Mhm. Mhm. Just like have just give it everything. Everything every time you play a card. Well, that weird thing's going on on, on that one. You are zero on Motani. That's great. That's great. Uh Oh gosh! Ooh, they completed the sort of this and that's uh, cycle. Yes. Yeah. So now we have all ten of them. Yes, we have the sword of once and future three mana artifact equipment costs two to equip. It gives uh, the equipped creature plus two plus two protection from blue and black. Whenever the equipped creature attacks, you can surveil two, where you look at the top two cards of your library, put either of them back on the top of your library or into your graveyard, and then you can cast an instant or sorcery spell that costs two or less for free from your graveyard, and that spell must be exiled. That one's a fun one. That one's a fun one. These swords of this and that are pretty powerful. I, I agree. Yeah. And, uh, 
I pulled one uh, during uh, from Phyrexia All Be One. I pulled the uh, Sword of Sword of Forge and Frontier. Mm-hmm. Haven't got to play it. Yeah, those. It's in a deck. Equipments, man. I, I feel like equipments are powerful. They're just hard in a lot of ways. Hard to play, in my mind. Um, I've got I've got double faced cards pulled up. Obviously, I alluded to it earlier. Heliod, the Radiant Dawn. A lot of these, a lot of these cards, uh, you're going to be able to cast. You cast to the front side of them, and you get a creature. And then for an another cost, including one Phyrexian mana of a certain color, you can flip it to its backside, where you get the Phyrexianized version of that card. In the case of Heliod, that's Heliod the Warped Eclipse, which makes him white blue instead of just white. Uh, and the new ability is it's a uh, Phyrexian god that's a four six. You can cast spells as though they had flash spells you cast cost one less to cast for each card your opponents have drawn this turn so some new mechanics uh the elish norn one i feel like is all of the praetors all of the praetors have the creature on the front side and on the back is a saga that when you get to the last chapter you get an effect and then it flips back to its front side uh elish norn i feel like this is probably one of the weakest elish norns the saga side's pretty good the saga side is pretty good front side is just whatever but uh, in terms of the Praetors, I think Urabrask. That Urabrask is is the best Urabrask that's been put out to this point. By far. For those of you that are curious, a two red red four four first striking Phyrexian Praetor. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Urabrask deals one damage to a target opponent and adds one red mana. For one red mana, you can exile it, return it to the battlefield, transform. You can activate only as a sorcery. Um... And only if you've cast three or more instants or sorcery spells this turn. So he's feeding you mana to cast more instants and sorceries. And if you've cast three of them, you can use one of those mana that he generates to flip them. On his backside, <laughs> Enchantment Saga, the first the first chapter, uh, the Great Work is what it's called, deals three damage to target opponent and each creature they control. Mm-hmm. So a single player board wipe with a punch in the face. For a lot of a lot of creatures. A lot of creatures yeah. uh, second chapter, you create three treasure tokens. Third chapter, until the end of turn, you can cast instant and sorcery spells from any graveyard. If a spell cast this way would be put into the graveyard, exile it instead, and then you return it to its front face. So you'd be able to cast all your shit from your graveyard, which is awesome including other people's cards so you can steal <laughs> other people's board wipes. Sadly, it does not have the stipulation that it can be mana of any color. Yeah. That would have made it even that much better. But you do have three treasures, hypothetically. Yes, you do. You should have three treasures, which will be able to... That, that's the whole design of yep. it, is that you can crack them to get different colors of mana to cast other people's spells. He's like a he's like a mini Storm Commander, you know? Oh, you're, yeah. You're not, you're not necessarily trying to you know, cast nine spells in this turn so you can, you know, you can grape shot for a thousand damage, but mm-hmm. casting three spells, flip them over, immediately do a punch in the face, and then if you have any sort of proliferation in, in your decks, any of these, any of these Saga... Uh, uh, praetors would be great with some proliferation just to be like, all right, did the thing, proliferate, get another counter, next turn, as soon as mm-hmm. I'll keep, okay, I've got him back, I can start all over again. Yep. Uh, one quick thing, uh, just going to touch on lands real quick. There are the full art basic lands as we've talked about. The dual lands for this set are going to be the life gain lands. There's going to be the 10 for each of the color pairs. They enter tapped, and when they enter, you gain a life. What you got? We just been rambling on we about magic rambling. cards. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just ready for this, you know, this set, you know, this, this weekend. Get some, get some packs, and so that on Monday we can crack them. I'm just See what we got. To that, uh, you know, yeah, I think at this point, any of the cards that I get, I'm gonna be hyped for. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. There's a lot of good cards. It'll be fun. I'm not as hyped for March of the Machine right now as I was for uh, All Will Be One. I like the set mechanics of All Will Be One a little bit All more. All Will Be One had some good set mechanics. Uh, but. We'll move on to the wrap-up. we got two wrap-up items. Uh, as reported by PC Games, an upcoming D&D-style RPG, RPG. I cannot fucking talk today. What is up with me? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Upcoming D&D-style RPG Dragon Air gets even more Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, uh, it is Dragon Air Silent Gods. It's getting an, addi- uh, an official Dungeons & Dragons crossover, and Matthew Mercer is going to be a voice actor. It is a mobile game uh, it's from the same publisher as Marvel Snap, uh, Newverse, if you're familiar with that. They do not have a release date for it yet, 
but uh, the initial release is going to have a crossover with Dungeons and Dragons. It's going to feature uh, Urtu, a massive Baylor demon from Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you will also be fighting him with Drizzt to Erden. Drow Ranger will be accompanying you to help. And uh, yeah, if you're into if you're into that kind of thing, it's it's cool. It's kind of like Diablo two or three. This article says so. All right, have fun with that. Uh, already got too many mobile games that I want to play uh, between having Magic the Gathering arenas to play at work, being able to remote play to my PS4 while at work. Uh, also, there's going to be another Kingdom Hearts mobile game that will come out eventually. I don't know when. And there's also a Persona mobile game that will come out. I don't know when. So You're just, you're just loaded up, man. My, phone, my phone's going to be fucking cooking. <laughs> the last little wrap-up item. Uh, previously announced, Project Black Flag a new uh, tabletop uh, RPG system from Kobold Press. Their uh, D&D 5e replacement set got its official name, Tales of the Valiant. Much better than Project Black Flag for a TTRPG. I agree. I agree. Uh, Still not a ton of information on it. Uh, They're going to have a player's guide and a monster vault. Uh, It's going to include 13 base classes, lineages, and heritages from classic fantasy role-playing. All the rules you need to play in two books. Kickstarter in May 2023. So look out for that. Look out for that. That's That's exciting. That is all of the news that we have this week. Obviously, we did not do our spoiler cast for D&D Honor Among Thieves simply because uh, we haven't seen it yet. I mean, we could we could, we could do our best and yes. just not see it and do uh, the spoiler Chris, cast. Chris Pine's character, spoiler alert, Chris Pine character totally dies after having sex with uh, one of the Red Wizards of Thay. <laughs> Calling it right now. Mm. Big spoiler. Big spoiler. Big spoiler. Uh, that being said, at the end of the podcast, we will get, we will get some questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the various members of our, of our community. If you want to be a closer part of our community you can always join us in the discord server link in the link tree in the bio it is free and open to everyone up in that link tree you will also find our instagram uh our youtube our tiktok our amazon affiliate store and you can also listen to this podcast on podcast services around the globe sam what we got from the tiktok live all right mitchell marvin asks do you guys miss robin williams uh I mean, I wasn't until you said that just now, and now I will again. Thanks for that. All right. Yes, I do. Yes. I, I prefer to more as a voice actor than an actor, personally. But yes, yeah. I Yeah. Yeah. He was pretty iconic. His voice was always iconic, but, uh, I, you know, he's also just a little, a little before our time for his actor-actor roles and more yeah. before our time for his voice actor roles. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm going to move my phone so I can actually see it. <laughs> says near Renzi says, is water wet? No. What, things being wet is a state of having water upon them. All right. Uh, I hate I hate that. Disc- I hate that TikTok discourse that happened. <laughs> I fucking hate that. It's like, is water wet? No, water can't be wet because water is the is the object that that dictates whether something that normally is not that object of water is wet. It has to have water on it to be wet. Uh, Corslet, I think. <laughs> so I'm new D and D. How do I my DM? How do I make my DM cry as hard as possible? I was considering Geneva Convention. Oh. Uh, um. So I'm a big fan of not making your DM cry because they're another player. Um, but if you really want to make them cry, just look them in the eyes and ask them, "Who do you think you are?" Running around leaving scars. Exactly. Um, what are you looking up? <laughs> keep going. Oh, okay. Uh, do you want me to keep vamping on this question? Yes. Okay. Uh, as far as making them cry, make it make it happy tear tears of happy of happy joy and emotion. Um, if you go to a wonderful website uh, called tabletopbuilds.com and you search for their flagship build series, they give you seven multi classes that they consider the most powerful builds you can possibly build in Dungeons and Dragons, one of which is a ranger. I just want to highlight this real quick because uh, Pack Tactics did a great video on YouTube going over this. Uh, the They call it the Hex Stalker. I want to give you a quick overview of this character at level 20. This is a ranger predominantly class. You take your first five levels in ranger. You then take 
What is that? One level in cleric. Life cleric for the Goodberry life cleric nonsense. You then take... What was that? Three levels in fighter. Battle master. You then take three levels in warlock. Hexblade. You then take three levels in rogue. Assassin. You then take... <laughs> You then go back, take two more levels in Warlock to get to Warlock 5 to get to the Eldritch Smite so you can smite from range in addition in addition to your turn one Nova nonsense. This is a Gloomstalker Ranger, by the way. Then you, <laughs> then you take a level in Sorcerer. Uh, I can't remember what subclass that was specifically. And then you can go back and take uh, some additional levels in Fighter and Rogue to get more feats. Um, basically, you're just blowing shit up on the first turn uh constantly giving yourself and party the ability to inflict the surprised condition on the first ra- round of combat with uh high stealth modifiers as well as passes out of trace and then uh just f- an unnecessary amount of healing from uh life cleric boosted good berries there's also several other flagship builds that are uh, equally ridiculous and broken so check them out all right, there you go. Uh, <laughs> subscriber and mod of this of the stream, uh, Mystery Sniper, when we were talking about uh, movies that had come out recently, says that Mario is pretty good. That's what I keep hearing. I'll choose to believe them. I believe I believe mystery. I always believe mystery. The disappointed dad. Oh. Hey, dad. Sorry. Um, my how, dad's not disappointed in me. How well... My, my not yet. <laughs> no, I'm not the disappointment. <laughs> how well do you think the GIF or Keth are for PC roles? For player characters. Mm-hmm. I mean, it depends. There's not a lot of really great lore for the for the Gith Yankee and Gith Zerai. Gener- uh, GIF, not GIF. Not, oh, the hippos, hippos the hippos. Yeah. Oh, that. I think it's. I. I it's I, fine. I love GIF. You know, especially since as of Tasha's. Yeah. Um, it's highly encouraged just to, you know, do your floating plus one or plus one plus one or forward floating plus two, um, and then plus two plus one or plus one plus one plus one. It's two and one. Two and one. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Um, these the floating stat boosts. Mm-hmm. You, you can really become anything, anything with anything with anything. Uh, and then it, most of the uh, the racial or heritage or lineage, whatever you want to call them, um, abilities kind of fade away within the first couple levels, mm-hmm. except maybe those that give you a free cast of something. A free cast, a uh, flat resistance to uh, damage, damage type, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's totally fine. All right. Two dogs parking. Nope. Two dogs porking. Oh, that's worse. <laughs> I'm playing my first ever <laughs> campaign. I went with a halfling fighter. Any tips on what archetype? I should play so many choices. So you have you have the route of simple, and you have the route of more complex. Mm-hmm. In the simple round, in the simple range, I would I would say, you know, the classic champion fighter is just going to be the fighteriest fighter that ever fightered. Um. Also in that realm, I would argue the arcane archer would be more simple it's very limited in the it options is, yes. it's simple in its limited options if you want to go more complex uh the eldritch knight and the battle master are really really good if you want like a good hybrid for a fighter i like the um the echo knight from the explorer's guide to wild mount it's a little bit complex you get like you get some little like shadow clones you can make it's powerful but it's not overly complex in the character creation part part like the Eldritch Knight is with spell casting and the Battlemaster is with Battlemaster maneuvers. All right. Oscar Barbie. Or you can be a weeb and be the samurai. <laughs> Oscar Barba asks, can you reckless attack for a barbarian without raging? Oh. Let us look it up in the player's handbook. The 2014 version, obviously. What's your What's your prediction? Ooh, I'm... I think you have to be raging. I, I don't know though actually I, I don't play I haven't played any barbarians for a long time alright here we are reckless attack you can throw aside all concern for defense to attack with fierce desperation when you make your first attack on your turn you can decide to attack recklessly doing so gives you advantage on 
Melee weapon attack rolls using strength during this turn, but attack rolls against you have advantage until your next turn. It does not have any stipulation about raging. There you go. So no, you don't have to be raging. Unless there's an errata somewhere we don't know about, but I don't think there is. I don't think so. This is this isn't this isn't a first edition player's handbook. I doubt. It might be. No. No. There we go. Yeah, it's it specifically says this printing includes corrections. <laughs> All right, we have uh, Daving uh, da- Daving Gould. Is Side, there... Quick sidebar: If you're recklessly attacking, you should probably be raging. Yeah, you got to get that. Extra. You, you, the you, point you, is, you take half damage while you're raging. Yeah, you probably should. <laughs> you don't want to have advantage on you when you're taking full damage. But, Carry on. <laughs> um, Daving Gould asks: Is there a conversion to bring Dragonlance to five E? Yes, there is, Gavin. In fact, uh, they pr- they published this last. Winter. Winter, yes. At the, uh, uh, right around Christmas time. Uh, yep, so they added a there's a few new player options, and there's a story yep. around the Shadow of the Dragon Queen. Dragonlance, Shadow of the Dragon Queen, specifically. It's got it's an adventure book, uh, but it's also got all the lore on the gods. Uh, it's got some cla- uh, character-specific features for races. It includes the Kender, uh, a, a specific thing <laughs> you have one sorcerer subclass that is included it's got some specific feats and backgrounds and stuff that are thematic as well uh actually a pretty good book it also came with a board game uh you can play some of the encounters with the board game you don't need it though yeah uh the board game it's a it's a neat idea because it lets you do mass combat in a board game setting all right uh oops. let's see austin pirate 53 says is it hard to understand D as a beginner when you're first playing so here's what I've discovered recently. I was listening to a podcast. It's a story podcast, and they did a whole ep- did an entire episode of the you characters from the story playing D and D characters in a, in a small level one combat encounter. Basically, listening to it, I can understand how a, how somebody not involved in the hobby would get immediately like blown out of the water with it. Mm-hmm. As soon as you start looking into it and actually starting to like. You know, just even a, a cursory glance at, oh, I want to play. Maybe I can start learning something. I think it's very easy to pick up from there. Yeah. Uh, the main thing is for probably 90 to 95 percent of the things that you're going to do. You if you know what a D20 is, a 20 sided dice, you roll it, you add something or subtract something. And that's all. <laughs> then you get to do the thing. <laughs> Reading the feature explains the feature I right hear. Uh, jump down and they ask. How do you tell, decide who's telling the story? Whoever is brave enough to DM. And also whoever role plays the best in the in any given moment. Eh, I would. <laughs> it's a collaborative storytelling thing. It's, it's everybody. Tiny Mister says, what is the best way to play a bard and what race should I pick? Going back to Tasha's, you can pick any race and, and really customize them down to how you want. Yeah, I would argue the best bard's the lore bard. You get access to a ton of spells from all the other classes and... Uh, Race it doesn't really matter, honestly. There's not any. If if you want to do the route of like a valor bard or a swords bard, go with one of the races that gives you martial benefits, like the half orc or the goliath or something like that, to make your martial abilities a bit buffed up and help you out since you're not actually a martial class. But then again, you probably should just be spellcasting. But the bard, as far as it goes, the bard has a lot of versatility um, and, in in its utility. Mm-hmm. Uh, so really, however you want to play it, and if you're asking for roleplay suggestions, do what makes you happy. You know, if you want to be a singer, go for it. If you want to be a chef, but not take the gourmand feet, and just be a bard who throws cupcakes at his friends, go for it. I love that. I love that. I love that. Shower them with sprinkles for your, uh, bardic inspiration. It's a good time. Uh, the one, the onely pod. The onely pod. They literally pod? I can't. Uh, it's hard to see the near names in, on, on our screen. CR is fake news when we're talking about uh, new challenge ratings in the upcoming 1D&D. Hmm. Wrong. I, 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 I agree, don't, actually. Yeah, I don't really use CR. I just like, all right, is this a cool thing? Does this have my, does this minimize my thought process when it comes to challenging the players? Yeah, you gotta vibe it out, is yeah, the thing. You gotta vibe it out. You gotta vibe it out. Also, I just had a thought. Am I muted? No, you weren't. No, okay. I was, say, I, didn't think I, was muted. <laughs> I was looking at the waveform and I got concerned because yours was a lot quieter, but I'm just louder than you. Fair. Uh, let's see. Jimin J. Did anyone ask about the published 
ask about how the published modules would work with the VTT? Oh, so, no. Uh, with upcoming published campaign books and campaign settings, I don't know about settings, but with campaign modules, uh, they in the original D&D Direct from 2022, they specifically announced that campaign books are going to include digital codes for redemption on D&D Beyond. Huge plus. Huge plus. And when applicable will include uh, pre-made maps for the virtual tabletop, as well as assets associated with that campaign setting that you can use to create your own maps in that setting. Uh, they're really they're really wanting you, if you buy a book from us, you get all the things because we want you in our ecosystem, mm -hmm. which is, I would argue, very good for the consumer, which is not a, they presented that as themselves. And I remember at the last D&D Direct how freaking excited and hyped we were about all this shit. And then slowly throughout the end of 2022 and this year so far, it's just been, oh, fuck, man. They Calm really, down. Really started shooting. They, they like, yeah, they started shooting themselves in the foot. MTG Marco asks, why do we care about so much about the reserve list? MTG Marco, I don't really care about the reserve list. I think it's unnecessary. I guess, um, yeah. There's a lot of cards that I think are too powerful and they probably shouldn't be reprinted. Like we don't need we don't need Black Lotus being reprinted. It's just too strong. Um, but at this like the reserved list is just collectors items and they've already broken the reserve list a couple of times, so you know, yeah. whatever. It it was it was in a time when people didn't want it, their collections devalued and and with the amount of product they're releasing now it doesn't matter. I would argue. Michael Mozart asks, why is your camera got a lens effect on it? It does? Uh, the sides are curved. Oh, uh, because we put a lens on it so you can see us. If I took the lens off, it would cut off like half our face. That's we're, why. Yeah. And we're pretty. So you want, we want to see? Eh, I'm pretty. Uh, and also asks, is D&D &D like a pyramid scheme? Well, you see. Short answer, no. Long answer, no. I mean, if if you go out and you get five of your friends to play D&D &D, as you as the dungeon master, then each of them will become the dungeon master and five of their friends, and they'll all buy Wizards of the Coast products, according to Wizards of the Coast. How dare you. How dare you. <laughs> uh, Crippled X Wizard says, need that new herb, asks. Yeah, that's a good card. I, I hope I pull that card. That's a cool. Yeah. That's a good one. Any of the Praetors would be cool to pull. They're very, they're very powerful cards. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Captain Slick says, what's up, dudes? And maybe once a human. Hey, maybe once a human. We recognize that name. Yes, indeed. indeed. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? Hello. Those of you who joined late, thanks for coming in. Um, Is that about all we got? We're almost there. Somebody asked how planes chase worked, and uh, somebody else came in. So, oh, 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 here we go. Uh here we go. Eddie K asks, how does plane chase work? And I was going to say, don't know. But <laughs> thankfully, Ryan Theum came in and said, you can basically have a world enchantment from, uh, from a separate deck in the form of planes. On your turn, you roll a dice to either planeswalk or have the planes effect happen. But just a battlefield effect that affects everybody. Yeah. Effectively. Can you have a D&D &D campaign set in the Magic the Gathering? There are actually official yes. settings. The Theros setting, the Ravnica setting. Uh, Strixhaven. Strixhaven. All of those are D&D &D planes. We, if you go back into the archives of the Dungeon Bros podcast, you'll find our entire review discussion of the Strixhaven campaign setting. Uh, our, our TLDR on that, or TLDW, watch, or TLDL, didn't listen. Um, it's good. <laughs> So, if, you, if you like Harry Potter, you'll like the Strixhaven book. There was a, there was some conversation about uh, about the angle, the angle making it feel like people people are expecting to see like just a dead body laying off in the corner. Listen, you don't need to you don't need to see all the corners of this room. Okay, don't look over there. <laughs> There's a wasp that wants to get in that window right now, though. It's been slamming into that window for like the last 30 minutes. Like, I will, oh, I'm going to fucking get these guys. I think we're starting to lose the plot here a little bit. So I'm going to say. We, uh, <laughs> this is the last one that I uh, I think is. Are you too excited for Baldur's Gate 3? Eh. Maybe. I haven't played it. 
Oh, here's an actual question. The beta. Well, yes. Yeah, These are all actual questions. Sorry. Uh, this is one we actually have an answer to. We haven't played the Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, buddy of ours does and has been playing the beta. And he's kind of disappointed in it. And it's beta testing. It's beta testing. I'm sure the actual game will be better. Ask Asha. Asks, what are we asking her? Says, never play, then. but my kids want to, to play with me. Play D&D with me, I assume. Any advice? There are a lot of great resources for child character sheets that simplify a lot of the rules and simplify a lot of the mechanics. Uh, there's also a lot of great... Um, YouTubers out there that have done things that help make playing D&D better. Uh, my brain immediately goes to one of my favorite creators, uh, Black Magic Craft. Mm-hmm. He built a small uh, play mat with, instead of one inch grids, it's like inch and a half grids. So the blocks are a lot bigger, making it a lot easier to move miniatures across a grid for kids. Uh, and then I would just simplify combat down to its very basic um you get here's your d20 here's your damage die and that's kind of and just i would fudge things it's like oh you want to be a fighter okay so maybe don't go past level five Mm -hmm. or level three uh you get your extra attack maybe give them extra attack earlier um just do basic stat increases instead of feats at level four uh features like um second wind like just simplify it so that's the same die as the weapon they use just so that make it simple and then as they get older you can give them more die and more more dice sizes and more details and be more true to the books i would say and by the if they're a teenager yeah just play the fucking game <laughs> one of those things if if you're if they're asking how something works have them read it out and then together you figure it out how how it yeah. works and that's my advice for anybody because i play with people who are in their 30s and we still have to do that they'll be like how does this work and i'm like well what does the book say yeah and they'll read it out and we'll go, okay so together it's gentle parenting as a dm it's gentle dming gentle dming <laughs> i love that if you if you can be a good if you can be a good parent you're probably can be a good dm probably if you're a good parent seeing as i we, would like to reiterate that it's fair <laughs> the qualifying statement there um we're we're about an hour twenty into this. I think that's a good place I to think call it's a good it. Place. Uh, next uh, at Dungeon Bros HQ this weekend, we have the pre-release for March of the Machines. We'll be doing our uh, weekly Monday Night Magic. Will be a special pre-release version of our live stream of Monday Night Magic. You can join us there. Usually nine p.m. Uh, Eastern time, beginning for uh, on our TikTok page where we'll be live. We'll be cracking open our pre-release kits. And uh, we'll be we'll be getting some code cards to give away into the Discord server. You can find that link in the link tree in our bio. You can also find uh, our Instagram, YouTube. The a link to our TikTok is up there if you're on one of the other platforms. Uh, you can find our podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify, um, microwave ovens, yeah. uh, uh, smart light bulbs. <laughs> yeah. uh, you're listening to your friend's belly gurgling while they're waiting in line at a drive-thru. Have your friend swallow a zune Ooh, and find a zune. yeah swallow a zune with like the the really loud headphones mm. and just crank it up and then you can uh put your ear to their tummy and listen like uh they have a newborn baby inside them yeah it'll kick too yeah <laughs> yeah the podcast the podcast kicks back <laughs> that is true uh also in that link tree you can find our amazon affiliate store <laughs> If you want to support us, um, I, I'm tired. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for uh, listening today. And in the meantime, 